the Terrifying Lies podcast with music and stories by Craig Nibo. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Terrifying Lies podcast, where all can hear that low voice beckoning from the dark corners to join the minions of the night. I am Craig Nibo, your host. Welcome to another interest season edition of the Terrifying Lies podcast. Today, I present something more from the archives of the Freestyle Gargoyles. For those of you who haven't heard of the Freestyle Gargoyles, it is an interesting experiment that I and my friends like to conduct, usually around Halloween. Picture this. Several talented musicians and authors come together for a night where we infuse words and music. Today's episode features Wendy Tolliver and Jason King. These storytellers perform their short stories live But here's where things get wild. An ad hoc collection of musicians will play a fully improvised soundtrack over the authors with no prior knowledge of their stories. It's like a horror jam session, sometimes chaotic, sometimes beautiful. With no more delay, let's get started. I now present Wendy Tolliver and the Freestyle Gargoyles. me after school at my godmother's gift shop. After I ate not one, but two slices of her homemade apple pie, it just kind of hit me. A feeling that something bad was going to happen. Something that would change life as I knew it. So I drove to Walnut Grove Cemetery, hoping to shake the feeling. It seemed to work while I sat cross-legged at mom's grave, bundled up in my gray pea coat, my extra long scarf flapping in the winter breeze. But now, as I hunker over the steering wheel in the parking lot and turn the key in the ignition, I've turned the feeling back on, and it's just as strong and ominous as before. Maybe it's just the apple pie, I tell myself. I ate way too much, and it's sitting in my stomach like a lump of concrete. Or maybe it's the way my godmother's voice cracked when she said, Alexis, promise me you'll be careful right before I left her shop. Perhaps it's simply because I only got my license this very morning, and I'm not used to taking the Mustang out on my own. I never thought I'd miss Uncle Vince sitting shotgun, barking instructions in between, this is important, it'll only take a moment, cell phone calls. 
I close my eyes and fill my head with soothing, happy thoughts. The aroma of coffee in the morning, the smoothness of piano keys under my fingers, the serenity of a snowy night. When I open my eyes again, the late afternoon sun is suddenly shrouded in dark gray clouds. The first few raindrops thump, thump, thud on the hood. Then other raindrops enthusiastically join in. Where is the stupid window wiper switch? It rarely rains in Cardinal, Utah, especially in the wintertime. However, the dark clouds, the slushy sidewalk, the downpouring of freezing cold rain, it all seems fitting. It is my birthday, after all. Finally, I flip the right switch and the wipers come to life. They swish, wash across the windshield sluggishly at first, and then gaining momentum. It's still hard to see, but I know this stretch of country road inside and out. And I'm not nervous. Well, maybe a little. My cell phone rings. Slipping my fingers into my backpack, I fish it out and glance at the screen. Hi, Vince, I say. If it were anyone else calling, I would have just let it go to voicemail. But it appears I've already missed a call of my uncle's, and besides, he never talks long. He's probably just wondering when I'll be home. I made him promise not to try and throw me a surprise party like he did last year. A sweet gesture, but I've never been into celebrating my birthday. All I can think about is how my mom died because of me. So this year, I told him all I wanted to do for my birthday was ditch my morning classes to go to the DMV and get my license and then have a quiet, casual evening at home. I'm on my way. I dropped by Helene's shop on the way home. I thought you'd probably go there, Vince said. To his credit, he keeps his tone neutral. My uncle and godmother don't get along. He thinks she puts crazy new age ideas in my head. You didn't answer your call, so I called over there. Helene said you left an hour ago. I know him well enough to realize he's not calling me a liar, as much as trying to line up all the facts. That's just the way his attorney mind works. Yeah, I had an errand to run, I say, being deliberately vague. I know it's not normal to spend so much time at the cemetery. And through the years, I've learned to keep my visits on the down low. That's one of the biggest reasons I'm so excited to have my own car and driver's license. The closest bus stop isn't exactly close. But like I said, I'll be home soon. Where'd this rainstorm come from anyway? It was just a little overcast a moment ago. Wait, Alexis, you're not talking to me while you're driving, are you? Uh, not anymore. The instant I hang up, the car slams into something. I pound on the brakes and the Mustang fishtails and skates for a few seconds before coming to a stop. Squeezing the wheel tightly, I try to catch my breath. I peer through the hazy headlight beams, straining to see what I hit. Absently, I twist the key to the off position. The world is silent and still all around me. But my mind screams and every muscle in my body tenses. The moon peeks through the clouds and abruptly as the rain started, it stops. I still don't see a deer or anything on the side of the road though. Is my premonition coming true? I open the door and step out, vaguely noting that there's not a dent on the hood as expected. But I feel no relief because not two seconds later, I hear it. A groan. I run to the side of the road and there he is. My heart pounds so hard, I swear it's trying to explode right through my rib cage. Oh my God, I hit a man. His head jerks and I sigh in relief. He's alive. Hello, hello, can you hear me, I ask, my voice shaky. Are you okay? Of course he's not okay, I reprimand myself. I think it's safe assumption that his leg doesn't usually bend that way. His handsome face is badly scratched and bruised, yet he watches, with me, watches me with surreal calmness in his eyes. They are dark and beautiful. I have a strange, unsettling feeling. I've seen those eyes before. I don't know where or when. I'll go. I'll call for help. I have a cell phone in my car. Be right back. Don't move, I say, in case his neck is broken or something. And then I 
race back to the car. In desperation, I dial 911 and report the accident as coherently as I can. The operator assures me she'll have emergency personnel there, ASAP. Although she says to stay on the phone with her, I shove the phone into my coat pocket. I hurry back to my victim. Sinking to my knees, I take his hand in mine. It's so cold. With my free hand, I uncoil my scarf and gently wrap it around his hands. The ambulance is on his way. Everything is going to be fine. Dark red seeps through his shirt, and for the first time I notice he's wearing scrubs under his black leather jacket. But he looks too young to be a doctor, or even a nurse, or a hygienist. If I had to guess, I'd say he was 17 or 18 tops. I feel terrible. Oh God, I'm so, so sorry. I force myself to blink, to look away, to hide my tears. Something in his eyes holds me there though. And I feel as if I'm dangling hopelessly above the flames of hell. Why had I answered my phone? Or why hadn't I pulled over before answering like Coach Hansen always told us to do in driver's ed? All those horrific slides of wrecks caused by distracted drivers, the ones he forced us to watch, are still fresh in my memory. And now, the image of this boy lying on the ground, broken and bloody, will be etched in my mind forever. I could have beat myself up for days on end, but then he squeezes my hand and his entire body starts convulsing. No sign of the ambulance. Not a single car is driven by. What's taking them so long? We need help now. If I don't do something and something fast, this poor boy might not make it. If I don't make the right choice, he might die. I'd have to live the rest of my life as a murderer. My stomach rolls, and that lump of apple pie concrete threatens to come up. I take a deep breath, gathering all my courage, and I give him a smile. Can you tell me your name? Giovanni. I'm not sure what I expected, but his smooth, sexy tone grabs me. Plus, I can't believe how composed his voice sounds, given the fact that he'd just been hit by a car. OK, Gio, I'm about to tell you something. I dig my fingers into the ground, the cold, crusty snow mud and brittle grass jabbing into the tender skin beneath my nails. You're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but I swear I'm not lying. I clear my throat, forcing myself to keep going. I've never done this before, not without Helene's help. I pray I'm not making a huge mistake. Ask me for help. I can help you. I can heal your wounds, but you have to ask me. Is he grinning, or are the shadows playing tricks on me? I don't need your help. He's still grinning. Of course, he thinks I'm off my rocker. What I need is for you to hop back into your car and drive away, and never speak of this little incident to anyone. I cross my arms over my chest, shivering uncontrollably. Please, Gio, you're making no sense. I get that you're in terrible pain. I know you're probably delusional or something, but what I'm asking is so simple and it will work. He can't die, he just can't. Just ask me for help, Gio. Ask me. What I'm asking sounds insane, I know that, but if only he'll trust me. I said, I don't need your help. His gaze dips from my eyes to my neck, and I wonder if he actually, if he can actually see the throbbing of my cro corroded artery as my heart pounds out an insane rhythm. Despite the rawness of my desperation, I feel a twinge of a knees in the pit of my stomach. Gio raises his chin. Water droplets trickle down his hair and run down the length of his cheekbones. His features at once beautiful and menacing. Go away. I'll go as soon as you ask me for help. It's simple, Gio, really. Repeat after me. Please heal me. Please. My fingers begin to tingle, and the warmth fills my core. Go away. He cringes, nearly overwrought with pain. I can't leave him, but if 
he refuses to ask me for help, what can I do? The warmth is gone, leaving me feel cold, wet, hopeless. The squeal of sirens punches through the blustery air, and I'm so relieved. My eyes brim with a fresh batch of tears. I jump up and race toward the road, flapping my arms to get their attention. The fire truck comes to a screeching halt, followed shortly by an ambulance. Over here, he's over here, I scream, and people in black pants and jackets rush the scene, only to stop a few feet from where I directed them to go. They spread out to each side, searching. Where is he, asks one of the firefighters. There's no one here, someone else says with a shrug. I can feel their eyes on me as I run to the spot I left Gio. Sure enough, he's nowhere to be seen. Gio is gone. This has been Wendy Tolliver and the Freestyle Gargoyles. The Terrifying Lies podcast will return after this short commercial break. Welcome back to the Terrifying Lies podcast. And now for Jason King and the Freestyle Gargoyles. Each has to walk through the valley of the dragon if he is to become a true knight of the dawn sky. Each must face the suffocating fog of the dragon's breath. It burns the skin, stings the nose, and worst of all, it blinds the eyes. Within that fog lurks horrors unspeakable, nightmares made flesh. But the most terrifying peril in the valley of the dragon, the thing that stops hearts and shatters most men, is the mirror. The soul mirror, or the mirror of judgment it is called by some. A standing man-sized pool of liquid glass. The mirror can show one all things. The answers to questions, the future of nations, even the lands beyond the veil of death. But first it must exact a price. To see oneself as you really are, to know all the consequences, both good and bad, of one's choices, to dispel all self-deception and deflate all excuses. This is what the mirror requires. Tis a simple thing, you might say, to gaze at one's reflection, but truth can cut, and comprehending self is a burden few can bear. Madness often follows. Only those who know themselves, truly know themselves, can survive looking into the mirror. 
a man who owns his choices, not just rejoicing in the happiness he has wrought, but a man that is willing to claim the sorrows he spread. Only such a man can survive the soul-scouring revelation of the mirror of judgment. Essek stepped out of the burning fog into a ring of clear air. In the center of the clearing was a tall, oval-shaped frame of white metal. Its edges were intricately worked with patterns that seemed to shift and change right before the eyes. In its center, where there ought to have been glass, was blackness. Thick, total, absolute darkness. It was as a pit had been set on its side so that some, someone could walk right in. Essek had been warned of oddities in this place of testing, things that seemed to be taken from dreams and deposited in reality. But this place, this valley, all of it was like that. All of it strange and dreamlike. Quiet as death and blanketed in the stinging fog. Essek had even thought he'd seen movement in that fog as he walked for hours, unsure of where he was going. Flitting shapes of things large and clawed. Yet he knew only one at a time could pass through the valley. Essek approached the mirror, half afraid that he would somehow fall into that pit of total blackness. But as, but as he drew closer, the darkness faded, replaced by what looked like rippling water. He caught himself, stretching out an arm to touch the surface of that water, but drew back. Touching the mirror was death, his master had warned him. The rippling, so the rippling slowly stopped, and the crystal blue liquid settled into a flat, shimmering plate of glass. Essex's shape formed in the mirror, and it looked much as it always did. He stared at the mop of unruly brown hair, his beady dark eyes, a nose that was crooked from being, being broken over and over again in his battle training, and that long scar on his left cheek. From the time he tried to force himself on that girl, the one who'd fought back. Wait, Essex stopped. Where'd that come from? He'd never hurt any girl. That scar was from sparring with Hanlon. Hanlon, his best friend and brother, recruit for the Knights of the Dawn Sky. A friend he'd known since he was eleven. That same Hanlon Essek had beaten to death for stealing six gold coins from his purse. Essek started. No, that wasn't right. Hanlon had fallen down the back stairs in their barracks. That was how he died, wasn't it? It was the mirror. It was doing something to his mind. Essek wanted to look away, but his body was frozen, eyes locking with the eyes in his reflection. Only those eyes had become red and reptilian-like. Those couldn't be his eyes, they were demonic. His face began to change, skin twisting and blackening until he looked like the mask children wore during winter solstice, when they pretended to scare away evil spirits and were awarded gifts and treats. Essek had been one of those children once. He remembered donning his demon mask and terrorizing the other smaller children, chasing them and bullying them into giving him their candy. When he became too old to wear the mask and solicit gifts from strangers, Essek had still gone out during the festival to scare the children. He remembered one fat little boy that refused to give up his sweet roll and silver coin. Essek had drowned him in a horse's trough. The reflection was completely monstrous now. Thick, black, scaly skin, long claws on his hands, glowing red eyes and horns jutting out above his brow. It was horrible. Essex shook, trying with all his might to run away from the mirror, to disappear back into the fog. Yes, I did those things, he screamed. I raped that girl, killed Hanlon, and drowned that little boy. I did them. It was true. All of it was true. It had always been so, no matter what Essex had told himself or others. He was a monster, and that was what the mirror was showing him. The white metal of the... My, the white metal frame of the mirror began to glow, its engraved patterns moving faster, rearranging themselves into different trailing designs. The glass of the mirror rippled like liquid and then disappeared, replaced again by that total blackness. It began to suck him in. As it called for help as he tried to break the pull of the mirror, soon he was on, his, on the ground, his nails leaving claw marks in the dirt as he was lifted into the air by his feet and hurled into the blackness. He expected to fall forever in some dark pit of hell, but Essex soon found himself walking again in the valley of the dragons surrounded by fog. It no longer stung at his flesh, for it was now made of black scales, 
It also no longer blinded him as his red vision could see through the fog. It no longer suffocated him, but gave him energy as he breathed it in. He now knew what the shapes he'd seen moving about in the fog were, for he was one of them, a monster, now and truly so. The mirror had shown him what he really was. This has been Jason King and the Freestyle Gargoyles. Good news. We have decided to assemble as the Freestyle Gargoyles for another rampage of words and music. We plan to live cast a fresh performance on none other than Friday the 13th in October. You will be able to tune in live on YouTube at my band's channel, The Rust Monster Band. Should you want to participate, shoot me a sample of your writing. You can contact me at craiglnibo at gmail.com. That's it for today's interest season episode of Terrifying Lies. Get ready for the Season 3 premiere, dropping on Friday, September 1st at high noon. As always, thanks for listening. I consider you all my friends. Until next time, I wish you sweet dreams. Or should I say, sweet nightmares. This has been the Terrifying Lies Podcast. Please, come again. You're welcome here. (laughs) 